Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. We appreciate very much for being here. For those of you that I don't know, I'm Judy Feniger. I'm the executive director of the museum, and I'm delighted to see you here tonight. There's nothing we like better than Jay's, Jay's clapping. I, I hired Jay to do that, and he did that. Very good. Very good. Um, we have such an exciting program tonight, and I appreciate especially that so many people are here when it was a short notice program and there's so much else going on tonight. So um, thank you for coming. The things that you're going to hear tonight are interesting and important and you all know that and that's why you're sitting in this room. Before we get into that, um, just a few notes. Uh, one is if you have cell phones, if you could please turn them off. Second, we have uh, some guests that we expect will be coming in, so uh, help them fill in the seats and we have a lot of our Great volunteers. I want to thank our staff and volunteers who are here tonight and put this all together. But we particularly want to thank the Inamori Center for Ethics and Excellence at Case Western Reserve University, who uh, brought this program to us, who brought uh, Beatrice and Peter to town, and who have been wonderful partners to us. There is so much happening at the museum here. If I told you about it, you would just see me on the podium, and you don't want to see me on the podium because there's too much else. But I do want to tell you a few things. Our fall program season has uh, just begun, and there are calendars out in the lobby you can pick up on your way out. Um, many people have said to me, what's this art up on the walls? And we're doing something we've never done before, and um, we'll see if we ever do it again. But we have a half cone show here. We've never had people into the gallery when the show isn't all up, so you'll see uh, there are some pictures with and without labels. When you come back here, and I hope you all will come back here starting next week, You'll see uh, displays of artifacts uh, throughout the floor here. The chairs will be gone. It'll be a whole different thing. And we want to especially thank uh, Kathy Halter and Marsha Wexford who with us tonight who uh, are sponsoring this exhibition. This is called Hardship to Hope, also Marilyn Kagan. It's an exhibition of African American art from the 30s and 40s from the Karamu Workshop. And those of you Clevelanders who know Karamu House today probably know it as a theater workshop but it was one of the first arts organizations uh, inter interracially uh, formed to bring people together through the arts. And the art that we have in the show and the programs that we'll have all season are just going to be tremendous. So we appreciate uh, the help of Cleveland State University, Cleveland Museum of Art, Cleveland Artists Foundation, Caramu, some private collectors, Western Reserve Historical, who have loaned us the art. Uh, that you'll see starting next week. It opens on the 13th, next Tuesday, and uh, we hope you all come back and see it when it's, when it's really up. The fall also is the kickoff of our Stop the Hate You Speak Out, our signature program, which invites students in grades 6 to 12 from a seven-county area to submit essays on hate, prejudice, discrimination that they have experienced or seen and what they would do about it. We're now entering the fourth year uh, and in the first three years, we've had more than 5,000 essays. So it's good news and bad news. The bad news is that there are 5,000 kids out there who have stories to tell. The good news is that through the contest, they're telling these stories. There are tens of thousands of people that have been touched through their schools and their families and the community, and they're talking about solutions. And at the Museum of Diversity and Tolerance, we feel like our core mission is to get the conversation going with programs like uh, Hardship to Hope, with programs like Stop the Hate, and like programs that you'll see tonight. Um, we have uh, uh, the anniversary of 9-11 coming up on Sunday, and in addition to a short commemorative service that will be here at the museum, we're participating with the Cleveland Orchestra and the police and fire, lots of other folks down on Public Square in a commemoration event where seven of the students who have been finalists in the Stop the Hate concert in the first in the round, Stop the Hate contest in the first three years will read their essays. So there'll be actually about a half an hour of the program that begins at 2.30, and there are some other uh, poetry and some other things, and then the orchestra concert for free on Public Square at 5 o'clock. So uh, we hope maybe some of you will come down there. Um, you're all experiencing the museum tonight through a program, but the best way to experience the museum is as a member. And I wonder if you could raise your hand if you're a museum member up here. Lots of you, yay, thank you. There's an opportunity for those of you who didn't raise your hand because you have a, uh, you, you received a key 
come when you came in for a special tonight only membership deal, $5 off, and there's a table out there. And we hope after you experience this program, especially if it's your first program, you'll consider joining as a member. Um, we have had quite a few days here in Cleveland because we have been lucky enough through Case Western Reserve University and the Inamore Center to have Beatrice Petwar and uh, a number of other distinguished guests in town for the Inamore Prize, and, which was given yesterday. So we particularly want to thank Case and, uh, and uh, President Snyder and Dr. Shannon French, who leads the Inamore Center, that couldn't be with us tonight because there are still activities going on. Um, but we are very privileged to have them uh, here with us. And I also wanted to acknowledge Forest City Enterprises, and Sarah is here somewhere, there she is, Charmaine Brown, who we worked with last year on Traces of the Trace. Some of you were there for that, the uh, tracing of a white slave owner family who found out that their ancestors had been slave owners and traced the path of slavery as they came to their own personal uh, uh, epiphanies about what that means to find out about your ancestry later in the game. And, Peter will talk a little bit about that. So we want to help. Uh, we want to thank all the Forest City folks who are here tonight. Uh, Beatrice, who you'll see a little later, and her daughter Tanya, who's been with her and has been such a good support these last couple days. We've been running her around and introducing her to people. And um, Avery Friedman, who will be up on the stage in a little while, and uh, all the all of our board members and staff and volunteers who are with us tonight. At yesterday's uh, prize festivities, there was a fascinating academic symposium in the afternoon in a packed room, uh, even more packed than this room, um, where a panel talked about uh, what's going on in Zimbabwe today. And Peter Godwin, who uh, you'll hear from in a moment, was one of those panelists. Uh, he's an award-winning foreign correspondent, author, documentary filmmaker, and screenwriter who was born and raised in Zimbabwe, studied law at Cambridge, international relations at Oxford, and after practicing human rights law in Zimbabwe, became a foreign correspondent co covering wars in more than 60 countries. He now lives in New York City. When we went to the museum earlier today, he took the citizenship test that we have in the museum. He did very well on it because he said he just took it to, uh, to get his dual citizenship. Writes for a wide array of magazines and newspapers, as well as the author of six nonfiction books. And we do have uh, when a crocodile eats the sun, a memoir of Africa, and he's recently released *The Fear* in our bookstore, and they're available for you uh, in the little side room after the program tonight. What we're going to do tonight is you're going to hear from Peter, and then he will uh, be joined on the stage by uh, Avery and Beatrice, and we'll have some conversation, and then we'll leave some time for questions and answers. So, thank you again for being here. We appreciate your coming. Some of you, I think, may have read When a Crocodile Eats the Sun in your, in your book groups, but I'm going to read a li little snippets from it um, as I talk, just to, to, illustrate, to illustrate the story. Um, 
when I grew up, my father was this very sort of um, pucker Englishman in the bush. He strode around in a safari suit and desert boots, and he had a walrus moustache, and um, he was, and he had a sort of force field around him. You couldn't really, he wasn't the sort of chap you could go up to and chat about intimate things. Um, uh, and he was very difficult to get to know, but he was, he, uh, he spoke in the sort of clipped kernel of, you know, British voice, um, and, and he did seem the quintessential Englishman. Um, so it, it, a bit later in life, when he was when he was ill, when he was, um, I'm, in fact, I was working for National Geographic, and I was down in, uh, on assignment in Zululand in South Africa, and um, in a place oddly where there was no cell phone signal, my mother, through sheer willpower, I think, got my cell phone to ring. Everybody around me was amazed, <laughs> including the chief, who they, they, sort of, they said, you know, who's your service provider? We were like, <laughs> they were looking at their phones getting no service. So, um, and it was my mother who amazingly had not only got a signal where I was in, 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 the, in northern Zululand, but it also made the phones work in Zimbabwe, which any of you who've been there knows it can be, can be quite something as well. And my father, um, she said, had had a heart attack and was... Um, was in the Paranatwa hospital where she then worked and she intimated to me that she thought that he wasn't going to make it and that I should get up there as soon as possible. So I, I jumped in my high car and drove as fast as I could to Johannesburg and took the plane from Johannesburg up to Harare and sat at my father's bedside and in due course he, he recovered and he went um, and, and after about two weeks he was released and he went home. And on my last day, when I was about to go back to New York, um, uh, I heard a banging in the sitting room. And after he left the room, I went in there and discovered that he'd put up a photograph. Um, in fact, I have well, a picture in here of it. Um, of three people, an old sepia photograph of three people I'd never seen before. A young middle-aged couple and, um, and a girl between them, evidently their daughter, who looked to be about 10 or 11 years old. And... Um, and I asked my mother about it, and she said, well, um, you know, ask, ask your father about it in due course. Um, and, I'll, and I'll read a little bit about what, what happens next, if you will bear with me, if I can find the right, um, the right place. Um, essentially, what my mother told me that day, and left it to my father to tell me in detail, was that far from being this sort of quintessential Brit striding with this Victorian party familia, striding around the bush in Africa, um, my father was actually a Polish Jew, um, and that this was something that she had known about all her life, that they had actually met um, in, in, in London after the war. Um, and that what had happened to my father was that he had grown up in a, a wealthy, secular Jewish family in Warsaw, um, and, in this, in this, it, and one summer his father, rather pressingly, uh, had decided that English was bound to become the new language of international commerce. At the time, almost nobody in Poland spoke English. If you spoke a second language, you spoke German or Russian or French. Um, and so he was sent to a, a sort of summer school in England, um, in, on, on, the, on the Kentish coast, uh, for three months to, to, to or more, even, to study English. It was a kind of a, a crammer. And on the 1st of September, Hitler invaded um, Poland, and my father never got back to, um, to Poland, and his family never got out. Um, and so he basically, um, he, he volunteered, lied about his age, volunteered for the Free Polish Army, and fought through, through the Second World War, was in the, the fought through D-Day, and up through France. Um, and at the end of the war, when he was demobbed, went to university uh, in London, and where, where, whereupon he met my mother, who comes from a very posh English family. And when they started to take a romantic interest in each other, my mother's mother, her father was dead by then, was absolutely scandalized, was terribly anti-Semitic. And um, uh, when my mother said they wanted to get married, she was, in due course, disinherited.